Self-driving cars might seem like a great idea, but if you're not careful, they might just adaptive cruise control you into a terrible tragedy. Like the other night, I was driving to the movie theater to see Fast and Furious 12, way too fast, way too furious, in my fancy new self-driving Cybertruck, when a poor defenseless squirrel darted out into the road. And while my Cybertruck is sleek, high tech, and cost the same amount as my three college degrees, it doesn't in fact have a squirrel in the road detector. My self-driving killing machine did nothing to save me or the squirrel. I was on my own as I, I frantically turned the wheel in the nick of time, saving myself and more importantly, Mrs. Squirrel from certain death. She lived to see another day and I made it to my movie on time instead of being carted off to squirrel jail, weighed down forever by the guilt of having taken an innocent life. With self-driving cars, it can help to have a human driver who monitors the situation. Someone who can accelerate, brake, or steer if it becomes clear that you're heading for a sweet, defenseless rodent. And economies aren't all that different from my hot new ride. In the US, we tend to think of our market as being generally self-regulated with the automatic forces of supply and demand keeping our economy in its lane and driving safely at the speed limit. But actually, there are a lot of other forces behind the wheel, like the central bank, ready to pump the brakes or hit the gas and keep our entire economy from careening off the road. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall Macroeconomics. Recessions, or times when GDP is lower because the economy isn't buying or making as much stuff, can cost a lot. During a recession, the economy isn't fully using its available resources, including labor. This leaves a lot of folks unemployed and without income to support themselves. It's still better than being a flattened squirrel under the tire of a three-ton Cybertruck, but not by much. But their reverse, expansions, or periods of big spending and unsustainable production, they can be brutal too. Expansions are tied to mounting inflation, with prices climbing higher and higher until you might not be able to afford a movie ticket to begin with, let alone a fancy self-driving car. Theoretically, if you wait long enough, market forces will do their thing and the economy will return to equilibrium. But that can take a long time. So in the US, the central bank, known as the Federal Reserve, or the Fed for short, can lessen the negative impacts of both expansions and recessions. The Fed is guided not by GPS or Google Maps or nor even Waze, but by something called the dual mandate. And no, this isn't my combined efforts to be a top-notch distance runner and the most knowledgeable Borg aficionado. Although that's going pretty good for me, actually. <laughs> for the Fed, the dual mandate consists of two goals that guide all its economic decisions, to maintain full employment and to keep prices stable with low inflation. This also means helping the economy avoid both recessions and too hot expansions. As we explored in another episode on central banks, the Fed can use monetary policy to impact how much money is flowing through the economy, known as the money supply. They also influence interest rates, or how expensive it is to borrow money. A lower interest rate makes it easier to borrow money to keep households and firms spending even during a recession when money is tight. If people and businesses are borrowing more and spending more, more money is flowing through the markets, increasing GDP, and hopefully pulling the economy out of its downturn. During expansions, on the other hand, the Fed can do the opposite raising interest rates to reduce borrowing and spending and cutting down the money supply so inflation doesn't go through the roof. But the Fed can't actually raise and lower interest rates like adjusting the volume on your Cybertruck's state-of-the-art stereo system. Instead, they make changes to things like the reserve requirement or how much money banks have to keep on hand rather than loaning out, the discount rate or how much it costs banks to borrow money directly from the Fed itself, and the interest paid on excess reserves, or how much the Fed will pay banks to hold on to a little extra cash instead of loaning it out. They can also buy and sell bonds called open market operations. All of these tools directly impact the money supply. And the more money in circulation, the lower the interest rate, the easier it is to borrow, and the more spending is gonna go down. And armed with these tools, the Fed has the power to save squirrels across the country and also influence the economy. As you might have already guessed, 
Recessions are the number one instance when the Fed needs to jump into the driver's seat and pump the gas. Recessions are particularly problematic because they can be self-perpetuating, as a decrease in spending leads to a decrease in production, which leads to layoffs, further decreasing both consumer and business spending. So when the economy is stalled out in recession mode, the Fed essentially wants to turbo boost things to get them going again through an infusion of expansionary monetary policy. They can use their tools to lower interest rates, hoping to encourage households and businesses to get back to borrowing and spending. This shifts aggregate demand, or the total demand for goods, back into fifth gear, or to the right in graph speak. And as demand and spending increase, those firms might be able to hire more employees. So we see unemployment falling in tandem with that increase in demand. And once the economy shows signs of improvement, the Fed can let the self-driving algorithms of the economy take the wheel again. Employment's up, GDP has risen to meet its potential, and everyone's out there spending big. Life is good, and it seems like smooth sailing, or driving, from here on out. But like with ice cream, movie popcorn, and Star Trek marathons on sci-fi, there can be too much of a good thing. And there are times when the economy is too hot, with so many people employed that open positions are going unfilled and so much spending that all the demand starts to drive up prices and look out! The economy is about to crash right into a squirrel! I mean, inflation! Unless someone pumps those big Cybertruck brakes, that is, assuming they work in the first place, somebody should call Elon about that. The Fed targets the average inflation rate at 2%, which like a speed limit of 37 miles per hour is slightly arbitrary, but does seem to be a comfy rate when it comes to balancing both employment and price stability. But sometimes people start spending so much that aggregate demand outpaces what's sustainable for the economy. And like a Ferrari on an old country road, the inflation rate really takes off, hitting four, five, or even 6%. So although employment is looking good, the Fed's got to jump back into the economic driver's seat to enforce the second part of that dual mandate. This is where contractionary monetary policy comes in. It basically gives the economy a big ol' speeding ticket to force it to slow down before it skids over a poor squirrel or ends up in a fiery crash on the side of the road. To cool the economy, the Fed uses its same tools to raise interest rates, making it more expensive for households and firms to borrow and therefore decrease spending. It shouldn't cut off consumption and investment altogether, just slow spending enough to stabilize prices. Generally, contractionary monetary policy is far less popular than expansionary policy because it means people and businesses are gonna start paying more for a loan rather than less. But it still beats skyrocketing inflation, just like a speeding ticket beats a fiery roadside death. When we look at this on a graph, we see the rising interest rates shifting aggregate demand back to the left. Assuming that no changes occur in short-run aggregate supply, real GDP will decline from its inflated level, heading back towards the more sustainable potential GDP, and the price level will fall. When the Fed pumps the brakes like this, it can raise unemployment and make folks less stoked to spend, which is another reason why it isn't gonna win any popularity contests. But while it might hurt to see your adult-sized ball pit dreams crushed by rising interest rates, for the time being, at least, it's ultimately good for both households and firms to get that inflation rate under control and prices back down. We don't have to look further back than 2020 to see how monetary policy can help the theoretically self-driving economy recover from unexpected shocks, like the unexpected shock of a global pandemic, which is a little bigger than just a squirrel in the road. In March 2020, COVID-19 sent much of the country into isolation. Many people stayed locked away inside rather than spending money on clothing, dining, entertainment, or travel. So it was no wonder that there was a huge economic downturn in the early weeks of the pandemic. Firms also cut back their spending in the face of plummeting demand and global uncertainty, further dropping GDP. Of course, our self-driving market unfortunately doesn't come with an automatic pandemic adjustment feature. So economists at the Fed had to buckle into the driver's seat they knew they had to get spending back up to prevent a full-on recession. By dropping the reserve requirement to zero and lowering the target range for the federal funds rates, they were able to bring interest rates down, 
which in turn made borrowing more attractive and encouraged households and firms to spend big. Suddenly, it was one of the best economic moments to buy that house for you and your family to quarantine in, of course. Unfortunately, Cybertrucks weren't yet on the market, but it also would have been the perfect time to go in on a giant futuristic robot truck that definitely won't rust after the first summer rainstorm. Low interest rates also meant good things for companies that needed to invest in more infrastructure to do takeout rather than in-person dining, making loans much more affordable. And these splurges didn't just benefit these brand new homeowners or businesses, but the whole economy by pumping an infusion of cash into the otherwise sluggish market. Slowly, the Fed eased off the gas, but the sports car that is the US economy kept on picking up speed. As lockdown restrictions eased, employment climbed, spending increased, and suddenly the US was staring down some pretty alarming inflation. Time to pump those brakes. As you probably heard on the news, to curb inflation, the Fed hiked interest rates back up. People slowed their rapid consumption and businesses weren't quite as voracious for loans with the higher interest rates, slowly cooling down that inflation. And in the end, thanks in part to the Fed's monetary policies, it seems like for the most part, the US successfully swerved around the recession and hit the brakes in time to avoid a collision with irreversible inflation. Though it's too soon to say for sure. My Cybertruck has amazing HD cameras and cutting edge neural net processing, but it can't see into the future, yet. We can't know exactly how our economy would respond if left to its own devices. After all, it is possible that by sheer luck, the wheels of my self-driving car would miraculously miss our little squirrel friend and we'd all live happily ever after without me having to lay a finger on the wheel. But we can guess that without the Fed's monetary policy, Shocks to the economic system, like what we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic, would send us further into the high, unsustainable heights of inflation or low, costly recessions. Having someone behind the wheel, even in this self-driving economy, can be a real benefit, even if it can't permanently change the economy when it comes to long-run potential GDP. Monetary policy can't make more land, labor, or resources in the economy, but because price levels and unemployment are influenced by more than just the resources available, the Fed can use monetary policy as a set of guardrails to keep our economy from careening off the side of the capitalism highway. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, uh, comment whether you'd ever get a self-driving car, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.